that the U.S. carriers withdrew their help, a Russian spy ship appeared and witnessed part of the attack. After three hours into the attack, the Israelis withdrew because there were witnesses, allowing the damaged USS Liberty to limp to safety. Forty years after the attack on the USS Liberty, we know exactly what happened. I've interviewed former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Thomas Moore. I've interviewed the admirals that were on the line who heard what President Johnson said. I've even talked to the head JAG officer of the Navy who was ordered to falsify the reports and cover up what had really happened. One of the Israeli pilots has gone public as well, saying that three times he refused over his radio to headquarters to attack the ship, saying clearly that it was an American ship in international waters and an ally. He was ordered under threat of court-martial to engage the ship. In a nutshell, this is what happened. President Johnson had personal control over the ship, parked it in the Mediterranean, made a backroom deal with Israel to attack it with an order to kill all aboard. Then the attack on the ship was to be blamed on Egypt. The U.S. would enter the war and take over the entire Middle East. In the aftermath of the attack on the most highly decorated ship in U.S. history, the captain and his entire crew were told they would spend life in prison or be killed if they told anyone what happened. Captain William L. McGonagall was given the Congressional Medal of Honor in secret and told not to tell anyone that he had won the award. Now that we've looked at a small cross-section of historical examples of government-sponsored terrorism, let's fast forward to the horrific attacks of 7-7 in London. Tony Blair, leader of the pro-war Labour Party, had lost a huge number of seats in the parliament and was fighting to keep his position as prime minister. And then right on time, the bombings of 7-7 and 721 occurred. Within days of the London bombings, evidence began to emerge indicating Western intelligence agency involvement. I traveled to London from Austin, Texas to personally investigate. Once I arrived, I was met by Paul Joseph Watson and his brother Steve Watson, who are reporters for my news website, PrisonPlanet.com. <laughs> to understand the London bombings and who perpetrated them, you first need to look at 311, 2004, the bombings in Madrid, Spain. Years after the blast that rocked trains in the city of Madrid, Spain, the government admits that Al-Qaeda had no connection to the attacks. Every one of the supposed bombers had intimate links to the Spanish security services, including the head of their bomb squad. The alleged leader of the bombers, who reportedly gave dynamite to the terrorists, was connected to the Madrid bomb squad. And we see the exact same earmarks, the same M.O., in the London bombings that we witnessed in Madrid. On the morning of July 7, 2005, three trains and a city bus were ripped to pieces when four military-grade explosive devices detonated. At 8.50 a.m., three explosive devices simultaneously detonated on three separate trains. Within minutes, eyewitnesses were reporting to the press that there had been multiple terror attacks. Despite the fact that three train cars were burning wrecks strewn with dead and dying Londoners, Scotland Yard for over an hour and a half claimed that all of the disruptions were simply caused by a power outage in the London Underground. Power surge on the Underground, that's all we heard. Um, I mean, the bus was about an hour after the, the Underground, so... 
that's when I think everybody knew that it wasn't it wasn't what it was, you know. I think it was just an excuse, power surge, whatever. Why would they say that though, knowing it wasn't? Trying to cover up probably, you know what I mean? So there wasn't no panic and everybody sort of like, just get on with everything, you know, so. Then mysteriously, 50 minutes into the attack, the London Police Department orders the number 30 Hackney to Marble Arch bus to leave its normal route and to park at the corner of Woburn Square and Tavistock Place. At 9.47, a fourth bomb detonates, killing 13 civilians and injuring many others. Note, out of several hundred buses in service that morning, it's the only bus that the police take special control of and direct to Tavistock Square. I've been walking up and down this road looking at the bus stops for a number 30. The bus stops have all the numbers of the buses on them individually. There's no number 30 on any of the bus stops. That's because the number 30 bus was specifically rerouted here on that day. To simplify it, there's no bus stop here. There's no number 30 bus stop here, no. Well, that was in the news that it was specifically diverted here. They admitted that the number 30 bus was the only bus that was directed to a different area of the city. For what reason? Nobody knows, but they admit that. So it's very strange that for no reason it would come down this road when it was bombed. Remember, while all this is happening, the police are on radio and TV telling everyone that it's just a power failure, an outage. Meanwhile, commuters on the bus were listening to other radio reports where eyewitnesses were reporting explosions. The supposed bomber on the bus with the rucksack became panicked and began looking in his rucksack in what witnesses said was a confused and frightened manner. Weeks later, police detectives investigating the case said that all four of the bombers on the three trains and the bus didn't fit the M.O., the modus operandi, of bombers. They'd bought two-way tickets. They'd played games of cricket the night before. They had good jobs and happy families. One of the alleged bombers was caught by surveillance camera arguing with the ticket clerk about the price of his pass. After Scotland Yard detectives had a chance to talk to some of the eyewitnesses from the bus and the trains, they stated clearly on the record that they believed that the bombers did not know that they had explosives in their backpacks. This was only one of many huge developments in the case that only received bare mentions in the back of the newspaper. The July 29th edition of Fox News Channel's Dayside program revealed that the so-called mastermind of the 7-7 bombings, Harun Rashid Aswad, is a British intelligence asset. Former Justice Department prosecutor and FBI terror expert John Loftus exposed the fact that a SWAT was being protected by MI6 and was clearly under their control. A SWAT is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London from on the 7-7 and 721. This is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him. And one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim sheikh said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working for the... So he's working for the Brits to try to give them information about Al-Qaeda, but in reality, he's still an Al-Qaeda operative. Yeah. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London. Now, we knew about this guy, Aswat. Back in 1999, he came to America. 